We thank you for coming out this evening to hear what the Bible has to say really about the future of this world. Because friends, shortly the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth and establish a kingdom which is described in those verses that we have read. Where there, it, it describes a king who's going to rule in righteousness. He's going to know what is right and wrong. And the outcome of those things, friends, is set out for us in verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God, of Almighty God, as the waters cover the sea. And there's the effect. It's, it's the effect of the word of God going throughout all the earth that's going to be dispensed from this government that's going to take, that, that is going to take over this world. And friends, the result of that is going to be remarkably different to what we see today. Because the problem with the governments of this world today is that they rule for themselves, they've thrown God and his word away, and the result is all the troubles and the difficulties and the, and the crises and the, the conflicts that we see in the world today. You see, friends, let's just have a brief look at, summarise in three points, the main governments of the world today, or the, that the world has tried over the years. You see, if you go online, you'll, you'll look, you can categorise governments in all sorts of ways. One way is, is simply this, either ruled by one person, by a few people, or by everyone. Democracy. All right? So let's have a look at these, at these, these couple of ideas. All right? Firstly, we could have an autocracy, and plenty of autocracies have been around in the world. Israel was ruled for a period of time by an autocracy. We're going to show you, in actual fact, the first king to rule was the only truly democratic election ever held. And I'll show you why that's the case. But here is the description of what an autocracy basically is. It's any form of government in which one person is the supreme power within the state. It is derived, it's derived from the Greek word self and rule and may be translated as one who rules by himself. It's distinct from an oligarchy, which is the next one we're going to have a look at, ruled by the few, or democracy ruled by the people. So friends, when we look at autocracies, largely the world threw out autocracies because really the autocrat at the top only cared about himself in the end, didn't he? So he only cared about himself, he looked after himself, he lived in opulence, and he didn't really care what happened to the people. Wasn't that the idea of the reason why the French Revolution took place? The people have got no bread, we'll let them eat cake. That was how out of touch the ruling powers of the last of the, of the kings and the queen of, of, the, uh, of the, the French was before they, they found their, their way to the execution. So that's autocracy. It's a failure, isn't it? When God is not involved. Let's go and have a look at the next option then. Well, we could have an oligarchy. Now, you may not know what an oligarchy is, but it's, it's the Greek word, which means it, it means, it basically means a few. It's rule or command in the hands of a few. It's a form of power structure in which power effectively rests with a small number of people. So instead of one person, there's a small number of people that rule. Okay? These people could be distinguished by royalty. So it could, instead of being one royal person, it could be a group of people. They could be distinguished by their wealth. They've managed to attain to that position by their wealth. It could be families, family ties, education. It could be a corporate situation. Or it might even be military control. And we know there are some countries that have military rulership and it's a military group that rules rather than a single person. Such states are controlled by a few prominent families who pass their influence from one generation to the next. And surprise, surprise, they've generally been tyrannical, relying on public servitude to exist. So in other words, 
they exert their power over the people, they oppress the people, and they enjoy many privileges. The other possibility is some are actually relatively benign. In other words, they're really uh, a quite, uh, quite simple sort of situation. But in the end, they all descend. Sooner or later, someone comes along who's serving himself. Then we have democracy, and that's put up as the answer, isn't it, as far as the world is concerned. I know in my place of work, if you say anything against democracy, it's a terrible thing to say because democracy is the answer. We need to be democratic in the way we, we live. But what does democracy produce, friends? Well, let's just think about that in a moment. Firstly, it's a form of government in which all eligible citizens have an equal say in the decisions that affect their lives. Ideally, this includes equal participation in the proposal, development and passage of legislation in, into law. It encompasses social, economic and cultural conditions that enable a, the free and equal practice of political self-determination. It originates from the Greek rule of the people, which was coined from the word demos, people, and kratos, power, to denote the political systems that were, that were then existing in Greek city-states, notably in Athens. So it was people, power, the people decided how, who, and what went on. So the people have their say. And make a note, friends, of the first point in, which, uh, in, in that particular section, a form of government which all eligible citizens have, citizens have an equal say in the decisions that affect their lives. And you know what happens, friends? You might know nothing about agriculture, but you have an equal say with the person who knows everything. That doesn't make sense, does it? And so decisions get made largely from people who know nothing about the subject about which they are voting. And so in the end, the political parties put up people who appeal to the people on reasons other than their credentials. And I heard a very interesting interview some years ago when there was two choices of people to put up in one of the political parties in, in this state. And they interviewed an ex a political expert. One was a very suave person, but he had lots of problems. If you think hard enough, you'll know who he was. He was forced to resign in the end. All right? Another one was a very honest, hard-working man. He didn't look good, but he was honest and hard-working. And the political experts said, I'll take that one any day because he'll get votes. The other one looks too cumbersome, although he was a genuine person. And there's your difference. That's how the world sees democracy. That's how they see their own system that they see as the best form of government. Democracy came about as a result of the French Revolution. Let's just go to Revelation chapter 16 and see what the effect was and what the effect is going to be in the end of this, of this uh, uh, the effect of the French Revolution of which democracy is a part. Because you know what the world's doing? The, 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 the democratic world is going around the world saying you should be a democracy and they're pushing this democratic system on country after country. You know what, friends? This spirit is going to lead to world war because the scriptures say so. Let's have a read of Revelation chapter 16 and see what the scriptures say about it. Revelation chapter 16 and verse, well, we'll pick it up from verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial on the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up, that the way of the kings, might, the, the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So these are the unclean frog-like spirits. Now, it's picking up this frog-like idea because they've come from the French Revolution. 
and they are frog-like spirits. He says they are the spirits, in verse 14, of demons working miracles which go forth under the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So here's these spirits of liberty, equality and fraternity which are going forth to the world and are going to end in world war in Armageddon when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return and a theocracy is going to be set up in their place. So friends, that's the outcome of what we are seeing in the world today. That's where it's leading. Now let's have a little bit more of a closer look. I just want to have a look at our own government very, very briefly. All right, We live in a country which is a democracy, which is hailed by the democratic world as one of the best. All right. Well, we've got a situation where both the Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader have less than 50% support by the people. So neither options for ruling this country has majority support. And that's a fact. Neither of them do. And they haven't for a long time. In actual fact, you've got to go back some way before you find a Prime Minister who had, for a reasonable length of time, more than 50% support. You see, is that what the people want? Have we got what the people want? Well, we haven't, have we? And what's the outcome of that? Where we've got a situation where the government only just hang, is only just hanging on to power. Well, the government holds its power by a small majority, and therefore it's dictated to by minorities within its party who say, if you don't do this, I'll leave. And they can't leave because one, as soon as they leave, the government's going to fall. Or else there's minorities in the crossbenches who they have to pander to to get their legislation through. And this is going on as we speak in the higher powers of this country. And that's how it's working. They're pandering to minorities to get through what they want. So people that got a few thousand votes are effectively making the decisions in many cases as to what happens in this country. You call that the majority ruling? I don't. Then what we have is a situation which has gone on for a number of rounds in this country where the opposition refuses to pass any economic reforms and the country's debt as a result increases. Come election time and they blame the government because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, get any... Uh, because the, the situation with the economy's got worse, the people vote them out, put them out, the other lot in, and we go round again and the same thing happens again. And we've seen that. It's just gone on now for a few rounds. And don't be surprised if we have another round soon, the way it's looking. That's one of the best democracies in the world. Let's have a look at another one. United States just had a gen an election in, in November last year. Donald Trump became pri uh, president of the United States as a result of that election. Well. Donald Trump got 46.4% of the vote, which translated into 306 college, electoral college votes, which got him to the presidency. Well, his op opposite number, Hillary Clinton, got 48.5% of the vote. She got more votes, but not enough college votes, electoral college votes, to get into the presidency. So she wasn't, he wasn't, the President of the United States wasn't, and didn't actually even get the most votes. Democracy? Really good stuff, friends. 46.4% of the votes is about 60-odd million votes. That's how many it was, about 60-odd million votes. 48.5% of the votes is just slightly more than 60-odd million votes. That's 120 million votes. There's 260 million people, or thereabouts, maybe it's 280 million people in the United States. So the President of the United States got about a third, maybe even less, of the votes, um, well under a third of the votes of the people. Many people didn't vote, of course. Their choice, I suppose. And what's the result? Well, people don't want their President. The media is bent on negatively reporting everything he does, rightly or wrongly. They're negatively reporting everything he does. And so he's on the nose from the day one. 
Let's go over to the other side of the country, the other side of the world, to Britain, another democracy. Last year they had a vote for, to, to decide whether they were going to leave the European Union. It's called the Brexit vote. And that vote got up by a reasonable majority. One of the champions of democracy, only yesterday or the day, be day before, because he didn't get the outcome that he wanted, is bent on changing that vote. So the majority of the people said, we want to leave uh, the European Union, but Tony Blair is saying, well, no, we, maybe we need to have another vote because we didn't get the outcome we want, so we just have another vote. So what you do is you just put it up time and time again until you get what you want. That's democracy, apparently. Does it sound a little bit like a farce to you? Because it does to me, friends. God said this. You see, the Bible tells us why this is the case. Because these people that are ruling the countries of the world are running around blundering because they don't know where they're going, because they don't have the control they claim they have. You see, Almighty God says this, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And the people ruling this country have a way that they say is right, but in the eyes of God it's wrong. It's the way of death. The prophet Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And we see that with the governments of this world. They may want to do something, but they may well be absolutely unable to do it. And there's the weakness of the governments of this world. I want to come, get you to come with me to Isaiah chapter 55 because what we're seeing, friends, is the difference between the ways of the world, the ways that the world, when they've rejected God, have chosen, and what we're going to see by contrast is the way of God. Because our opportunity, friend, is, friends, is to turn our back on that and to throw in our lot with the Lord Jesus Christ and the theocracy that he is going to set up very shortly upon this earth. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55 because we have an opportunity to be a part of that which is going to be established, which is so much better that people will never want to go back. Let's have a look at Isaiah 55 and verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. It's a call to, while there's an opportunity, turn to God. Turn away from that mess, turn to God. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, God's ways and God's thoughts are supremely greater and better than man's. And we have an opportunity to turn our back on man's ways and turn to God's. Because God's ways will work. Man's ways have over a period of 6,000 years been shown to be an utter failure, as man has blundered from one idea to the next. Now what I want to do, friends, is want to go right back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We want to see what God set out, how Israel should have, if they were going to have a king, what was required of them. Because, you know, friends, this theocracy is going to be ruled by a king of Israel. That's going to be the king that God is going to establish to rule on his behalf. And he set out the credentials of what a king should have in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and have a look at what Almighty God says regarding that king. What credentials a ruler, a chief ruler, should have in, a nation, in the nation. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to... 20. 
were, and, and we'll just read through that particular section and just highlight a few points. In actual fact, you can see them. I've put them up on the overhead there. Um, that's a summary of the verses that we're going to read. You see, um, this was given when the children of Israel were yet in the wilderness, when they were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years on their way to the promised land, the land which will be the nucleus of the kingdom of God in the future. And this is what Almighty God says, And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a, a king over me, like as the nations that are about me. You see, that is actually what's ha what happened. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. In other words, it had to be approved by God. One from among thy brethren had to be from among the Jewish brethren, had to be a Jewish king shalt thou set king over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not of thy, not thy brother. He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that, they, that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. That was a matter of who are you putting your trust in? You need to trust in God, not man. That needs to be a critical point as far as the king who should rule should be. He wasn't to go to other nations for help, he was to go to God for help. There's many examples of that in the scriptures where people failed in that regard. We read on. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart his heart turned not away. So in other words, he wasn't to be caught up with women that's going to turn his heart away from the things of God. And we've seen those problems in the ruling powers of the world. We've seen the problems that the, uh, the British royal family has had. We've seen the problems that many other rulers have had. President Clinton, for example. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So he's not to trust in money. His trust needed to be in God. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. In other words, he was to be thoroughly familiar with the word of God and that was to be the basis upon which he should rule. And so he had to be familiar with him. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. I cannot imagine our Prime Minister sitting up in his office reading the Bible. Friends, I can't imagine too many at all doing that. But that was what God required of a ruler, of a king, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and his statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. In other words, he was to be a humble king, that he wasn't to lord himself over his brethren. He was to rule for the benefit of the people. We don't see that in the world today, do we? That he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And you know, friends, ultimately the king that keeps that will actually rule forever. There's only one king that's ever going to do that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, I want to go to the occasion when Israel did actually wind up Choosing to have a king like unto the nations. I want you to come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8 because what I'm going to show you, friends, is this was the only truly democratic election ever. Now, that's a bold statement, but I'm going to show you why that's the case. This was the only truly democratic election because you know what happened? God searched the hearts and minds of people and said, this is the people, this is the what the people want. God, who knows the hearts and the minds of people, searched their heart and gave them the king that was their choice. Now let's see exactly what it actually says in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we're going to go first of all to verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 5. Um, here's the people, the elders of Israel, gathered themselves together unto Samuel in Ramah in verse 4 and said unto him behold thou art old and thy sons walk not in thy ways now make us a king to judge us like the nations so they wanted to be like the world outside not 
like God had intended them to be. You see what's happening? They're, they're trying to copy the world instead of turning to God. Well, God accepted their request and instructed Samuel to make them a king. We have that in verse 22 where he says, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. Verse 22. And in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, this is what the people, well, this is what got the people's votes. This is what got the people to want Saul to be their king. Let's have a look at verse 1 and 2. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Berakath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So here's a family, a mighty family of power, of strength. They've got lots of land. They're, 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 uh, they're, um, they're very, very, they've got great substance. See that word power? It means substance. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man. You know, all the girls swooned when they saw him. A goodly. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. What's it telling you about what he looked like? Remember what we said about what the electoral analysts said about the two possibilities for the party in Western Australia a couple of years ago? It's exactly the point, isn't it? This is what it was. It was a goodlier person. There wasn't a goodlier person than here. From his shoulders and upwards, he was higher than any of the people. So he was tall, dark and handsome. He was the Prince Charming, wasn't he? And he was the people's choice. Let's have a look what it says in, in 1st of Samuel chapter 9 and verse 20. This is what Almighty God says when he presented Saul to the people. And as he says, oh, this is actually when Saul was actually first told about the fact that he was going to be king. And he says, as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, Saul had been looking for asses. He'd lost them. And uh, so he's, he's not a very good uh, keeper of flocks, is he? He's lost his asses. This is Bible imagery that's being given to us. You see, what really mattered, he wasn't good at. But he looked good. That's what the people wanted. So Samuel, when he speaks to Saul, he says, As for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thine heart on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? So all of Israel desired Saul to be their king. And that's what Samuel's saying under inspiration from God. He says, God has taken a vote of all the people. He's looked at their hearts and their minds and what they want. He said, this is what they want. This is the people's choice. Let's have a look at chapter 12 and verse 13 and see what is said concerning this man. Chapter 12 and verse 13. Now, therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. So God gave them what they wanted. He gave them a king like the nations. He looked good. He was head and shoulders above the people. But he was a failure in everything else. You see, that's the people's choice. And indeed, Saul was the people's choice. He was not God's choice. Deuteronomy chapter 17. God says the king must be one who God approved of. So Saul is a failure in that regard. In actual fact, that's literally what happened. He was a total failure and God took him away in the end. That's what we're told. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13 and 14. So Saul died for his transgression. So 40 years later, he's brought, his kingdom is brought to an end. And God's going to replace it by a man after God's own heart. A far greater man. And Israel went to the greatest heights as a nation through the avenue of the king that replaced Saul, who God chose. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. You see, he wasn't there writing out the law. He wasn't reading in it day and night. He kept not the law of God. And for asking counsel after one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. You know what happened? He went around the nation killing all the witches. And then at the end of his life, he sought counsel of a witch. That's the sort of person he was. 
And that was the people's choice, an erratic man that never quite finished anything he put his hand to. And that could be a summary of Saul. And God says concerning this king in Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11, I gave thee a king in mine anger. God wasn't happy about it. And I took him away in my wrath. And indeed, almighty God did take him away in his wrath at the end of his life when he was slain on the slopes of Gilboa by the Philistines. So what's God's solution, friends? Well, God's solution, as we said, is a theocracy. It's a form of government which is governed by divine guidance. It's governed by a righteous, immortal king who has applied all those requirements of Deuteronomy chapter 17. He'll be assisted by righteous, immortal rulers. And the central policy of his government will be do all to the glory of God. Not of self, of God. Everything will be set up in order to honour and glorify God. Which remarkably, friends, brings everyone, humbles everyone, onto a remarkably, remarkably similar level and makes every, all the subjects of that kingdom, all the people in that kingdom, equal. Totally dependent on God and thankful for what God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done for them. It makes for a marvellous community, friends. So let's have a look at this king that's going to reign, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a look at his credentials. Does he tick the boxes? we've looked at from Deuteronomy chapter 17. Well, friends, we're going to find he absolutely does. You see, we're just going to take that list that we established in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and we're going to see, does it apply to the Lord Jesus Christ? The king must be approved by God. Yes, he was. God specifically brought him into the world. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 30 to 33, God actually said that he would be that king. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, we're told that he was a man approved by, of God by miracles and wonders and signs. So the miracles and wonders and signs that he did in his 33 and a half years or the three and a half years of his ministry were a testament to the fact that God approved of him because he described himself as the king who was going to rule in Jerusalem in the, when he returns to the earth. In Luke chapter, um, he, he, we're told, uh, it's actually uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 35 and 36, he sits at the right hand of God until his enemies are going to be made his footstool. So the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven and he's actually waiting for the time when he will return to this earth to establish the kingdom of God. You might like to also have a look at, uh, those words are actually taken from uh, the Old Testament from Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. Secondly, we're told that he must be from among his brethren. And indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ was a man. We're told that in Acts 2, verse 22. And he was, and he is a Jew. He is of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And the genealogies in, in both Matthew and Luke show us that that indeed is the case. We're told also in Deuteronomy that, he, that this, this king was not to multiply horses or to go down to Egypt for help. In other words, to go and seek help of the nations that are around him. Indeed, that was the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. The principle was that he should put his trust and his confidence in Almighty God. His trust was indeed always in his God. Let's have a look at this. At Luke chapter, in Luke chapter 23, when the Lord Jesus Christ was dying upon the cross, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, the most vulnerable time in, in, the, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was about to die. When he's dead, there's nothing more he can do to look after himself, is there? He's totally reliant on the God that he puts his trust in. It's at this point that we see how trusting he was of his God. 
when he says in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, he says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the spirit and died. And you know, friends, the Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what he was saying there. Because he was quoting the Old Testament. Now let's come back and see that trust because he never said the next words. But he knew what they were. Let's go back to Psalm 31 and verse 5 and let's see the trust in God that this man had. Psalm 31 and verse 5. You see, the words he said were, Into thy hand I commend my spirit, or commit my spirit. Let's read it in Psalm 31 and verse 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. And then there's a colon. It's a break. And that break, friends, I would suggest, was three days and three nights. The next words are these. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. They were perhaps the first words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke when he, when, when, when he was risen from the dead. You see what he was saying as he gave up the spirit and died upon the cross? He was telling everyone that his trust and his confidence was in Almighty God. The next point we have is that such a king was not to multiply to himself wives, and the Lord Jesus Christ was never married. Let's move on and have a look at the next lot of next uh, list, or the, the rest of the list in Deuteronomy chapter 17. He was not to multiply silver or gold to himself. And indeed, friends, that was the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. He did indeed not multiply to himself silver and gold. In actual fact, he had no worldly possessions from, apart from the very clothes he wore. And in actual fact, those were divided up by the soldiers when he was crucified. He had nothing. He says himself that he had not where to lay his head. So he had no worldly possessions to put his trust and his confidence in. Because his trust and his confidence was in God. He was to make himself a copy of the law of God. And indeed, there's never been a man who's had a grasp of the scriptures like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the Word made flesh, or the Word of life. Because everything that the Old Testament scriptures spoke of was fulfilled in him. When, when he was tempted in the wilderness by the man that came to him, he answered, thus it is written. Because he had a grasp of the scriptures that is second to none because he was wakened morning by morning and instructed by his father from his very youth and he was not rebellious from it. He was, he was to be familiar, a king, such a king was to be familiar with the law of God and to obey it. And friends, we can go no further, can we, than the words of Pontius Pilate who said, I think it's no less than seven times, I find no fault in the man. That's an interesting phrase, friends, because you know what? Here was the Passover lamb slain at Passover, and the Passover lamb was penned up for four days, just as Jesus Christ was, and was only slain if it was found to be without spot and without blemish. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ being crucified. And Pilate says, I find no fault in the man. And so here's the great credentials of this man. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews says he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And then finally we're told he was not to be lifted up in pride above his brethren. 
We don't have time to go to Philippians chapter 5, 2, verses 5 to 11, where the Apostle Paul says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself and became obedient under the death of the cross. On the basis of that, God has highly exalted him that every knee should bow to him. What we've seen is that this man fits all the requirements that God set out in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And indeed, friends, he is eminently qualified, perfectly qualified to rule this world. Let's have a look a bit more at the credentials of this king. This king, friends, has the power over the forces of nature. As he got into a ship in a massive storm where his disciples were unable to get across that river, across that, that sea, he stopped the storm in a moment. Now, you just think about it. How can you stop a storm in an instant? Waves do not do that. He's got power over the forces of nature. On another occasion, the moment he got into the ship, they were at the other side. He can transport from one place to another in a moment. This is the power of this man in his mortality. What about his immortality? He's got power over all the diseases that man knows of. We're told of what he was sent to do, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, and so forth. In, in Luke chapter 4, he could heal those who were mentally ill. He could heal those with a fever, with a word. He can heal, many can be healed by just touching him. He can heal leprosy with a touch. Normally, if someone touched a leper, they became defiled. He healed them. This is the power of this man. And you know, friends, we're told even in Luke chapter 5 and verse 17 that he had the power to heal the hard-hearted Pharisees, but they weren't interested. What that tells us, friends, is that he can heal the hearts and the minds of the most stubborn people but they have to be prepared to seek it. That's the power of this man. What we need to do and what we're being told is we need to seek it. We need to seek that power. He's able to heal the lame. He's able to raise the dead. He raised Jera's daughter from the dead. I think it's Luke chapter 9. And there's several others. He raised Lazarus from the dead, a well-known one. In, Luke, in John chapter 11. He has the power to forgive sins. The result of that is that if someone's sin is forgiven, they have a hope of eternal life. He has the power to raise the dead. We mentioned that before. He has the power to grant immortality to those who are faithful to him. Let's have a look at how the Apostle Paul actually lived in hope of that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4 and verse 8. You see, friends, what we're seeing is real credentials to, to solve real problems that no one else can solve. That's the sort of king that's going to rule this world. Let's have a look at... 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. The Apostle Paul says this, in verse 7 actually, he said, we'll begin, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, friends, the Apostle Paul looked in confidence to that day when he would be raised from the dead and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ as the, as the judge and be granted immortality. All his diseases healed. All his problems solved. All the pain and the suffering gone. Immortality awaits. That's the glory that that king is able to impart. 
Friends, we're talking about the most powerful human being that's ever lived. How will he rule? Well, let's come to a few quotes. We're going to just flick through a couple of quotes. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. And we'll have a look at, uh, at how that rule will take place and where it will take place from. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. We should have gone to verse 1, shouldn't we? Because in verse 1 it tells us where that's going to happen. is Judah and Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus Christ says concerning Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. Here's when that king is established. And Jerusalem... Mount Zion in Jerusalem is going to be established in the top of the mountains. That's the result of a great earthquake that's going to upturn the governments of this world. It's going to be established in the top of the mountains. And all nations are going to flow up to Jerusalem. It doesn't sound right, does it? Because it's not natural. It's not the normal way that man works. They're going to flow against the natural tide to come to learn of God and of his ways. And that's what we're told in verse, in verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up. I've actually drawn a line in my Bible from up there to flow in verse, verse 2 because flow up doesn't happen naturally because this is not natural. It's according to the divine way, which is not natural. Come ye. And the, the people will say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So here we've got the civil and religious capital of the world established. And God's ways and God's laws are going to go forth from there. With the Lord Jesus Christ reigning assisted by his immortal saints. We'll have a look at that very shortly. All right, what's the outcome of that? World war? No. Let's read the next verse. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. In other words, there'll be people who won't want to do it. He'll rebuke them. He'll sort them out. We, we could go to many places, Isaiah 60, we'd go to Zechariah chapter 14 and show you what happened when people refused to submit. All right. But let's just continue on. He shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. You know what? The world has that as a, as a big banner, don't they? At the United Nations headquarters in New York. And they go and they send people out as United Nations peacekeepers with guns. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Here, God's going to do it. And why? Because, verse 3, God's ways, God's laws are going forth. Because they are the ones that will produce peace. Isaiah 32 says, The fruit of righteousness is peace. And the world's never worked that out. But they will eventually. We went to Isaiah, we looked at Isaiah chapter 11. We're running short of time, so I might just skip Isaiah chapter 11 because we read it in our reading. Our, our chairman read it for us. We, and we saw the, the right and righteous judgments that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to administer. That he's going to care for the poor and the needy, where the, the wolf-like person is going to be changed to the point where they'll actually be able to uh, cohabit with the, with the lamb-like person. And the asp, and so forth. And there's peace amongst all the various types of people in the world because they've been affected by the word of God, by the laws of God. And it's changed them. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 65 and let's have a look. Isaiah 65 from verses 17 to 22 is another beautiful little section which deals with the conditions of this kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ is established as king. We only want to pick up a couple of, uh, a couple of verses, um, verses 21 and 22. 
where we're told that they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So in other words, it won't be a situation where we're living in fear. There won't be a situation where you plant a crop and someone steals it, or you build a house and the bank forecloses, or whatever might happen, or it gets burnt down or destroyed. God's saying here, what we, what we have here is people enjoying the fruit of their labours. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And the main point that's making, friends, is this. What happens in this world? Generation one builds up his empire and drops dead. Generation two squanders it. Generation three starts again. Or it might take a generation more, if you're fortunate. What he's saying here is someone who's prepared to put in honest work will enjoy the benefits of their work. See, that's the situation of that kingdom, equity. I haven't got time to go to Micah chapter 4 and verse 4, but it talks about everyone sitting under his vine and under his fig tree and none, none making them afraid. It's a return to agricultural-based living. And all nations, in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 12, will be required to submit to the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the right rulership thereof. And we want to briefly look, friends, at those who will rule with Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ, through the, the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 5, tells us that those who are faithful and those who identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism now, who throw in their lot with him and turn their back on the world, can rule with him in immortality in that kingdom. Friends, I'm sure you want to be there. I indeed do. Let's have a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said or what, uh, and, and what John wrote down about a vision he had of that kingdom, of those who are in that kingdom. And we're told, they, that is those who are in that kingdom, sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Is that, a, is that an attitude of pride or is that an attitude of humility? You see, these are the rulers of that kingdom. They're humble people. They're ruling, they're going to rule for the benefit of the people and to the glory of God because they develop those credentials now through the word of God, affecting their lives. How does it finish? And thou hast made us unto our gods, kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. They're the people who are going to dispense the, the, the civil and religious rules, the laws, the ways of God that we looked at in Isaiah chapter 2. Friends, we have an opportunity to be amongst those people. The choice is ours. What we need to do is prepare, be prepared to make that decision that we might be amongst that people when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish that kingdom upon the earth. We thank you for your time.